let's talk about Formula One as a game. And no, I'm not trying to get into the not particularly interesting debate over what constitutes a game versus what constitutes a sport. I'm just going to run with the broad generalisation that sport is a game, just with more sweating, I guess. I'm lumping sport in with games just to get my argument running. Games have rules, players, setups and objectives, and so do sports. The question I want to ask here is how do you construct a game, sport, whatever, to keep it fair, balanced and interesting to both the players and the audience. It's harder than you think. That's why good board games, video games and sports often take a long time to conceive and construct and not all of them are successful. You need to make it worth playing and worth watching. The reason the rules of football insist on having 11 players on each side and not 11 players on one side and just two players on the other is to keep the game balanced. You try and give everyone at least an even playing field to start with. It's not particularly interesting for anyone if one side is overly stacked against the other, which is why, if you've ever played Mario Party games, you'll notice the three versus one minigames are often the ones that tend to be the poorest and the least fun. It's an incredibly difficult and nuanced job to rebalance a game once you've weighted one side over the other. One criticism labelled at F1 in recent years, and through several periods in its history, to be fair, is just how predictable it is, and just how unfair it is. Mercedes are likely to win the title, Ferrari or Mercedes are almost certain to win each race with only Red Bull getting that outside chance of sneaking a victory. And I wrote the first draft of this script back in early February and it's April now and what I just said is still pretty true. F1 as a sport often goes through these phases with one or two dominant teams scooping up all the wins and most of the podiums, with the remaining teams, even the best of the midfielders, sniffing around for scraps. And this leads to frankly astonishing consequences. Despite F1 being the playground of the mega wealthy, the lower end of the field tend to be at a permanent risk of bankruptcy with smaller teams regularly dropping out of F1 altogether when they can no longer scrape the pennies together to compete. These teams will either vanish or be bought up by the next billionaire who wants to play. It's rather mind-blowing that arguably the second most successful Formula 1 team, Williams, seems to be balancing on that cliff edge right now. Now, in theory, sport should be something of an even playing field, with the overriding differentiator between winners and losers being talent. In much simpler sports, like, say, running, the differentiator is overwhelmingly the talent of one individual, the runner. I mean, you can include a little bit of the talent from their coach or whatever, but when you watch a running race, you tend to come away from it thinking, yeah, the winner sure was the best at running today. In F1 it's more complicated as many more people contribute to a racing driver's success on any given race day, but in theory the success should be the combination of the talents of driving, engineering, management, strategy and so on. And is it? Well, sort of. And sort of not. Because it's not a level playing field. In 2018, Mercedes and Ferrari, and to some extent Red Bull, started with a massive advantage over everyone else. And you're probably saying, yes, Chain Bear, we know. What's your point? See, it's just something we're used to. But the key word here is started. They started with that advantage. Let's look at another scenario. Let's go back to board games. Let's say you and the family sit down and play Monopoly together every Christmas because you're all masochists or something. And every Christmas, everyone knows that Auntie Jenny will always win because Auntie Jenny is both ruthless and absolutely incredible at Monopoly. Her ability to weigh the risks and her luck with the dice is second to none. But every time you set up a new game, everybody at least starts on go with the same £1,500 and zero properties, right? In F1, every time a new season starts, it's like the winning players in Monopoly getting to keep most of the money and properties they won from the last game and taking them forward into the next. And when you play like that, how on earth can someone like poor Alfa Romeo ever hope to dream of victory when Mercedes already own all the dark blue properties? And honestly, it's something we got very, very used to, but really F1 should be a place where Alfa Romeo or Salba could win the championship. Maybe not straight away, but does anyone honestly think Alfa Romeo could put together a strategy for challenging for the title over the next pff, five years? So, people in the F1 community, let's get a little self-critical. Let's talk about positive feedback loops and how there are far too many in Formula 1. But before I get into what positive feedback loops actually are, I want to take a very quick break to thank Skillshare for sponsoring this video. 
Um, I've wanted to mention Skillshare for a while actually as one of the most frequent questions I get to this channel is how do you make your videos? And that's a question with a long answer but the easiest way for you to get started in learning about creating videos or in fact any number of skills is through Skillshare which is an online learning community for creators like me that hosts thousands of classes in everything from designy stuff, setting up a business, tech wizardry, all that stuff. If you're a premium member, you get unlimited access to brilliant detailed courses and how-tos so you can get started in something you love or just take things to the next level. So if you want to make videos like me, you can see they've got, um, well, over 500 courses on that alone. If you want to try your hand at some animated explainer videos, then there are some breakdowns on things like infographic animations and all kinds of cool stuff in After Effects, which is what I use. An annual subscription is less than $10 a month, but you can do what I actually did and use a free trial after listening to an advert about it. Skillshare are offering the first 500 of my subscribers who sign up via the link in my description unlimited access for free for two month period. So click on that link and plunder all that good stuff at your leisure. All right, thanks for indulging me and thanks to Skillshare for giving you some free access. Back to the video. A positive feedback loop is a system where the outcome of an effect fuels the effect itself thereby causing an effect to escalate and escalate. It's something that amplifies itself. That's a bit abstract, so here's an example. Let's imagine a fire. Let's say you drop a lit match in a barn full of hay. Now the match is just a little fire, but fire needs oxygen, heat, and fuel to grow. It's got fuel in the hay and heat from the match, so the nearby hay catches fire. Now there's even more heat, so it causes more fire. And now there's even more heat, which is causing more fire. So the growth of the fire accelerates until the whole barn is burning down. The fire creates heat, which creates fire, which creates heat, and so on and so on. This is a positive feedback loop. The output of the fire, more heat, is driving the input, the fire itself, and causing that fire to escalate, to grow and grow and grow. How does this work in F1 then? In a way, it comes down to the old success breeds success mantra, a phrase many sports people use proudly, but what are the mechanisms behind success breeding success? Well, let's pair F1 down to a simpler model. To be a successful F1 team, you need a few things driving that success. Good drivers, of course, that helps, and that's what we end up talking about the most. You also need talented team members. These include the people that design and build the car, as well as those who manage the staff, make the deals, and just get stuff done. Money. You need a lot of money if you're going to go big. Partly you need it to pay the staff mentioned above, but also to buy the best equipment for your R&D, to build plenty of parts on demand, and to make your team attractive in all sorts of ways. You also need good suppliers of things like engines, fuel, electronics, logistics, IT, all of that gubbins. And there's many, many other things, but let's just stick with these for now. How does this play out then? Well, let's look vaguely at Mercedes, but in a very stripped down, simplistic way. Why were Mercedes so successful in 2018? Well, to start with, they had one of, if not the best driver in Lewis Hamilton, leading the championship charge. Plus, they had a solid, unspectacular Bottas to help that. They've got a team of great designers and managers and a really slick organisation with the right people in the right places. It's just been a well-oiled machine for the last five years, really. Mercedes were getting things done compared to, say, McLaren Racing, which was a bit of a mess as an organisation. They've got buckloads of money some from Merck HQ, some from the winning portion of the prize money, some from their high-profile sponsors, including that oil giant Petronas. And speaking of Petronas, it's one of their many strong partnerships with suppliers, which I'll come back to in just a moment. All of these things increase their chances of success and ultimately a strong world championship win. All of this success then means it's easier for them to get the best drivers. Most drivers want to win and almost everyone on the grid would kill for a Mercedes drive. If a seat becomes vacant, Mercedes will basically have the pick of the field, barring any contracts. Similarly, designers, managers, engineers, all the good staff are going to be more inclined to work somewhere like Mercedes than a smaller team to get busy in a successful environment for that chance to win, to learn, to accelerate their growth and exposure. And if that isn't enticing enough, Mercedes certainly have enough cash to hook them in. But speaking of money, this is a multifaceted thing. Obviously, there's the prize money, but again, success brings people flocking. Sponsors want to support winners. Mercedes have prime livery space for all and sundry, and it's worth a lot more than some of the other teams too. This means Mercedes won't have to fight too hard for sponsors, and they can charge premium rates too. And remember those supplier partnerships I talked about? Well, when you're a big successful team, you can convince suppliers to work with you rather than it just being about money changing hands for a service. 
you'll work together on lubrication or whatever, because why wouldn't Patronus want to say they're the ones that made Mercedes' engine the silkiest, smoothest combustor on the grid? So you see, success increases your talent pool, your money, and your technology, which in turn will increase your success. And so the system feeds itself into making the successful even more so. Now, positive feedback loops can also work the other way too. That is, a lack of success, or a heavy helping of failure, I guess, will cause good drivers to move on, staff to leave, sponsors to look elsewhere, your income to drop, and make it more difficult to do good deals with suppliers. This then massively reduces your chance of success, which results in poor performance, which depletes the factors you need to win. So you're trapped in a cycle of poorer and poorer performance until the team ends up folding due to lack of money and talent. We see this with F1 minnows all the time. Caterham, HRT and Manor infamously never stood a chance, but many, many long-standing, seemingly stable little teams have fallen out of the sport once things took a downturn. These models, the spiralling success and the plummeting failure, are both positive feedback loops, as the effect continues to be amplified by feeding itself. Success fuels success, failure fuels failure. Now a negative feedback loop is where success fuels failure, and vice versa. Or rather, the more successful you are, the less likely you are to continue to be successful. Now, this sounds intuitively wrong, doesn't it? But let's look at that barn fire again. We agreed it was a positive feedback loop because the very existence of fire was causing more fire to occur, as fire needs heat to grow, but also provides more heat to allow it to grow. But fire also needs fuel. As the fire reaches the point where it's literally all-consuming and set the whole barn ablaze, it's actually destroying the thing it needs to survive. The hay. More fire eventually means less hay. So the growth of the fire means a reduction in fuel, which ultimately means the demise of the fire, which eventually burns out. This, this burning out phase of the fire, is a negative feedback loop. At this stage, more fire means less fuel means less fire. It was extinguished by its own success. But negative feedback loops aren't all a bad thing. In fact, I'm about to argue hard for implementing them carefully. Some sports deliberately try and rebalance out-of-control positive feedback loops by introducing some negative feedback loops into the system. Here's one example you might be familiar with, success ballast. Some motorsports implement a rule whereby the more successful drivers get extra weight added to their cars. There are many ways of doing this, but one example might be that the top eight drivers in one race will get extra ballast added to their car for the next, the winner getting the heaviest extra weight and the eighth place driver getting the smallest extra. More weight makes your car slower, so it makes it harder to win next time. So this is a system where being successful reduces your chance of success next time out. The idea here is maybe that over time, the competition will start to balance itself out over several races, as the more successful cars will get heavy enough to more evenly compete with the weaker cars, in theory. Another example of a negative feedback loop might be reverse grids. You know, say we just abolished qualifying completely and lined up the grid in reverse championship order, or the reverse order of the previous race. The more successful drivers and teams are given the greatest disadvantage, so again, being more successful reduces your chance of success next time. These two examples are among the most obvious I could think of and probably are not the ones I'd implement or endorse personally, though reverse grids can potentially be very fun to watch. I just use these as examples, it's very clear to see in them how success feeds into an impediment for continued success. Now the good thing about negative feedback loops is they tend to stabilise. Whereas positive feedback loops cause out of control runaway outcomes, i.e. dominance leads to bigger dominance, negative feedback loops curtail any escalations. So runaway success is penalised, but runaway disasters are helped back up, so nothing gets too out of hand. Fans and competitors would likely decry the particular example solutions I mentioned before as too artificial maybe, and probably rightly so. But on this point of things being too artificial though, let's never forget that all of F1 is extremely artificial. And I don't mean because it's more about engineering and motors than muscles and sweat, I mean the rules are all an artificial construct to create a game. There's layers and layers of artifice in creating F1, and that's not a bad thing. That's just how you manage a complicated sport, where the technological side makes the rules and aims a little bit more than throw this thing the furthest, or get this ball in a hole. And without the level playing field of, say, athletics or the purity of spec car racing, 
you do need to rebalance these positive feedback loops that come out of letting teams design and build their own cars. You can introduce negative feedback loops a little more subtly than throwing more weight at the winners or forcing them to start at the back of the grid though. There are ways of giving a little something extra to the smaller, less competitive teams without completely upsetting the balance of competition. Now I'm not an expert on this, but you know, a few ideas can come to mind as starter examples. These aren't necessarily things I'd specifically advocate. More examples of bringing in systems to rebalance things and give smaller teams a chance to work from their already disadvantaged position. From 2004 to 2006, teams who had finished outside of the top four in the previous Constructors Championship were allowed to run a third car in Friday practice. This car had to be piloted by a young driver, which also was great for giving junior drivers F1 experience without having to yank your actual race driver out of their seat. There is an added expense to this, but think of the free testing mileage smaller teams could get from this third car if you gave it its own power unit separate from the extreme engine usage limits of the race cars. The smaller teams have the slight advantage of being able to learn more about their cars, new parts they want to try and about the circuit itself before the race. It won't give their cars a massive performance boost, but it gives them more of a chance to improve relative to the giants at the front. Their previous lack of success feeds a system that gives them a better chance of success going forward. A negative feedback loop. On a similar note, you could restrict or expand testing opportunities for the top or bottom teams respectively. So at a four day winter test, perhaps the top three teams would only be allowed to run for three of those days. Little bonuses like this for the smaller teams could aid their path to success or even their survival. Here's another one. At the moment, all teams are restricted in how they can run their wind tunnels and CFD machines. That's computer simulations that allow them to virtually test aero parts. A simple tweak to this would be to give more flexibility in how less successful teams are allowed to operate their wind tunnel and CFD simulations. This would increase the smaller team's chances of catching up and reduce the bigger team's ability to accelerate away with their design advantage. You could even do something as simple as removing some of the existing positive feedback loops, like making prize money equal across the board. Winning the championship already brings so much positivity as we've shown. Why get extra money on top of that, further increasing the gap between you the winner and those the losers? Anyway, this video isn't about my specific ideas about fixing F1, it's about demonstrating how positive feedback loops can spiral out of control, and if we introduce some negative feedback loops into the game, we can at least temper some of this runaway madness that only makes the big, competitive, rich teams even more rich, powerful and competitive, instead of redistributing the power back to the smaller teams. Because this is a sport, it's a game, it's meant to be fun and competitive across the board and not dominated by a couple of all-powerful teams. That's not as thrilling as you really want F1 to be. At some point, F1 needs to acknowledge it has a problem that needs fixing. As it's not a spec series, it needs to introduce systems that reduce the horrific positive feedback loops that harm competition, drive away audiences, reduce viable avenues to success for smaller teams, and end up making everything kind of predictable. Yes, the best team should win, and I'm not trying to force Mercedes to compete blindfolded with one hand behind its back. I'm saying that just because Merck won last year, it shouldn't carry all of that huge advantage through to this year, and next year, and the year after that. They shouldn't keep holding all the cards for every game. A new season should, in theory, be a new season, and while F1 will never be like Monopoly, where everyone starts from the exact same point at the start of every season, there should be far more opportunity for every team to turn up at the start of the year with a potentially winning car, right? Williams may have mucked up 2019 something rotten, but imagine being able to think, ah, they'll go back to the drawing board and come back strong in 2020, and then really take it to Mercedes and Ferrari, instead of thinking, well, I can't see any way for Williams to come back from this. They've got no money, they've lost major sponsors, they seem to be spiralling further into disaster. I really can't see them hanging around F1 for much longer. We need potential new teams, be they manufacturers or privateers, to look at F1 and think, yes, joining this sport will not be a massive waste of our time. And I think that's entirely possible, but there needs to be a proactive push and considered implementation of systems that start to unpick the runaway feedback loops built into the sport. Thank you.